I, uh, one thing that I did notice is it's different because originally uh, started this uh, when we doing the Hello, everyone. This is Hello. Dr. Sain. This is Sain. Um, I'm with the Minnesota Department of Education, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to do a couple of housekeeping things and thank yous before we get started. So it won't take too long. I want to thank first of all the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, I've been working with four colleagues and four states on um, digital, digital Inclusion Alliance Corps. It's made possible through an IMLS grant that was um, hosted by NDIA. So I want to thank them so much for the opportunity I've had all year. And I want to thank very, very much um, Madeline Tate from PCs for People for being our speaker today. Um, PCs for People is a star digital inclusion organization in Minnesota. Um, a lot of people who came to the NDIA Net Inclusion Conference in St. Paul last year um, toured uh, PCs for People, and um, they just do wonderful work. And they're spreading word to our state. Um, just a few couple things. If you have any questions, if you could please put them in chat. We'll also have an opportunity after the webinar um, where you can just say your question. But if you have a question during, if you could just put it in chat. Um, to make things complicated, um, it looks like I'm Jennifer Nelson um, because I'm using her WebEx account. So either do the chat to via Jennifer Nelson or to everybody um, if you feel comfortable doing that. But I'll be making, taking notes of questions, and then we'll address them all at the end. And also just say them at that time. If the webinar, you, you could please mute your name. I'd really appreciate it. Um, if you can do it by star six or um, what works on your phone. Um, and just to let you know, we are recording the webinar. I've had some requests for that, and it just um, so if you would like the recording afterwards, um, I think I can send it to most people attending, but you can also email me, and I will put my email in the chat. So without further ado, here is Madeline Tate from PCs for People. Hi, and um, I wanted to echo Emily's um, thanks for attending this, um, and hopefully we're able to provide some helpful information. Uh, and, and future opportunities to work together and help your communities um, gain affordable access. Um, to repeat, my name is Madeline. I'm with PCs for People. We're here in St. Paul, Minnesota. I also have an office in Colorado. Uh, we're able to offer all of our services online. So hopefully um, many of the people you're working with and the inclusion efforts you're performing can help utilize our services as well. Uh, to start, I'm just going to give a brief history of PCs for People, um, kind of talk about some research, um, specifically by Pew, um, that kind of covers the digitally distant communities, uh, talk more about what we PCs for People do as an organization, and how we do it. So, so to start, um, PCs for People was founded in Mankato, Minnesota in 1998. Um, in 2008, we became incorporated, received our 501c3 status, and moved to Saint, moved headquarters to St. Paul. Uh, we kind of had the idea that we would start small. Um, we grabbed, got 500 computers from local businesses, thought we set for a while, um, and word quickly got out. And we very quickly after that had a 1,000 family waiting list. We have partnerships with organizations such as the Blandon Foundation um, in Minnesota, which focuses on broadband adoption in rural communities, um, as well as having a, a deeper connection with the local United Way. We'll also be able to um, partner with a lot more businesses um, to get more computers, and we were able to eliminate our waiting list. Now uh, when people come into our office, they walk away that day with a computer. In 11, we lost our affiliate program here in Minnesota, which allows um, nonprofit organizations across the, the state of Minnesota to kind of utilize our software and our um, processes to help their local community. So we have a few affiliate programs um, throughout Minnesota here. In 12, we have our mobile computer refurbishing um, unit. We will 
will uh, partner with the community, a larger community. Um, we'll be there for a week. We'll work with businesses to collect computers. We'll refurbish them while we're on site and we'll them out at the end of the week. Uh, we've done this sort of program uh, with Thunder Cities, Fargo, um, uh, uh, Eau Claire. Uh, most recently, we were in Salt Lake City out a month. We will be in Austin, Texas, and we're looking to expand that even further. In 2012, we all started offering internet through a company called Clear. In 2013, uh, we were averaging signing up 25 new internet subscribers every day, and it, on average, giving out 33 computers every day. And this is weekdays. We were open Monday through Friday at that time. In 2015, we opened our first office outside of the state of Minnesota in Denver, Colorado. And uh, in 2017, we um, were able to connect over 18,500 home internet service in all 50 states, including Puerto Rico, and distributed over 13,000 computers. So as you can see from that graph, we're continuing to grow year over year. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, I like the digitally distant. Uh, so there's a few of the sectors that can play into why um, certain communities may not have, have access or have computers or internet in their home. Um, and those kind of break down to household income, race and ethnicity, age, educational attainment, and geography. Talk about the homework gap. Many of you might be familiar with that um, term. It just talks about uh, families with school age children in their home who don't have access to internet. And this is even more and more of an issue, as I'm sure everyone is aware. As uh, classes are requiring more and more, more work to be done on computers or with an internet connection. So those who do have that access when they get home after school uh, fall more and more behind. And as you from that gra um, graph, it affects people more um, who are um, non-white, um, non so people of color, as well as people who are um, in income. Next, you graphs are from a, a research done by Pew, where it compares um, uh, first compares um, ownership of computers, desktops, or laptops. Here uh, we see that uh, those homes with a lower income do a less um, to having a desktop or a laptop in their home. These kind of it were internet users versus. Uh, those households with um, a band adoption in their home. And just uh, as a quick kind of definition for everyone, the FCC's requirement as of 2015 for broadband, um, 25 Mbps down and three up. And this is through a, a wired connection. Uh, and so in the graph where it talks about broadband adoption, that's what they're referring to. In the graph that refer to internet users, Specific, that's a, a more broad, broad range. I'm talking about people who are either connecting wirelessly, using mobile data, um, or any usage outside of the home. So if they're connecting at a library, any public computer app, using the internet at work, et cetera. This first graph is talking about um, uh, who are using the internet at any point. And this is what the breakdown is um, based on income. We definitely see. Um, a really high internet usage across all incomes, but there is, of course, a decrease with those with, um, that are making less than 30,000. Home broadband users uh, see a drastic decrease. Over in adoption, it goes down slightly, but with the, the greatest decrease in those that are making less than 30,000 a year. Uh, next graph, I'll break it down based on ethnicity and race. And once again, this first graph is just those working um, to internet at any time, at work, et cetera. Well, the second graph is those who have access to home broadband in their home. Again, we see uh, a decrease of those um, that are non-white. Graph, again, uh, are just getting access to the internet um, with those um, above 60 and above uh, overall using the internet less, but still a, a relatively high rate 
compare those who have internet, home, bro home broadband internet in their home. Um, and finally here we have internet users by education, um, uh, of higher um, adoption for those with a college degree or above. Um, but again, a, a great increase specifically with those who have less than a high school diploma who have home broadband. Community type. Um, it's, it's something we definitely see a lot here in our work with um, Blinden Foundation that access to internet in rural communities um, is definitely lower than it is in metro and um, suburban areas, but then decreases overall um, across all communities, but hits the rural communities the most. Um, it's looking at home broadband. Finally, um, those with a disability, uh, a higher percentage using the internet, but a lower percentage um, that have access to broadband at their home. Um, in, in 2014, Pew did a research to highlight um, why certain people um, have access to or don't have internet um, in their home. And the highest percentage uh, reason why was because many people just didn't see why it was relevant. Um, below that was, it was the ability, it was hard to use, they didn't understand it. Um, didn't uh, broadband um, and the price and lack of access were the, the bottom two for that. Uh, again, did that research in 2016 and found a pretty uh, drastic change. Um, the percentage of people who didn't have it because they didn't see a reason is, is very small, not even at having its own kind of breakdown. And the majority reason why people didn't get a band access um, has become the cost. 3% uh, overall attribute it to the cost, with 33% um, in the cost of internet and 10% saying the cost of computers, um, which is is the reason pointing to why we at PCs for People do what we do um, to make access to this sort of technology more affordable. Uh, which brings us to kind of highlighting what PCs for People does as an organization and how we do it. Um, so we're a nonprofit organization, um, but to get the computers and equipment that we do, uh, we are an electronics recycler. We are AAA certified through the National Association for Information Destruction, or NAID, um, which uh, is how we ha handle sensitive data on hard drives. Um, we're compliant, which allows us to work with a lot of large businesses, banking organizations, government agencies, hospitals, etc to get um, the electronics that we are able to, to get. But we also take individual donations, so people who are local to one of our offices can just drop it off at our store. It's free. About 90% of what we collect um, from businesses is usable, um, with having to recycle the other 10%. Or on the flip side, um, for individuals, only 10% of the donations we come in from individuals are usable. Uh, individuals tend to use their computers in, for a longer period, whereas businesses often tend to, um, of course, depend budget, but to um, change equipment quite a bit quicker once it goes off of lease and things like that. Um, we're able to offer these services for free, um, both to businesses, which tend to have been paying for uh, their equipment to be collected and to be sanitized or destroyed, as well as individuals being able to drop that off. As, and as a nonprofit, we're able to provide a tax deduction for that. Um, and then once we get the equipment, um, any computers that are usable, so we say within the last 10 years, um, but within the last 10 years, we want to make sure that the computers we're distributing to families are um, something that will last for, for quite a few years for them. Um, so Microsoft registered refurbisher. Um, um, we'll get a Windows 10 license on them. We also include some free software so that the computer is usable for more things than just access to the internet if they have internet in their home. So we've got an open office, which is essentially the free version of Microsoft Office. Um, we include some free antivirus software, um, C Cleaner, et cetera, and some other um, helpful software included into the computer. And we make it as easy as possible for recipients to get a computer from us and use it when they get home. So it's 
in the box experience. They just have to bring it home, plug it in. They don't have to do any installations of Boktor. It's already programmed on there already. And the work uh, to refurbish these computers is done by a mixture of employees, volunteers, and interns. Our office in St. Paul is centrally located between some colleges, uh, which is a great opportunity for both us and college students who are interested in um, computers and technology. We, once we distribute computers, we want to make sure that they're being they're useful for as long as possible. And to help guarantee that, we do also offer computer repairs. Uh, even if a computer isn't um, was received from us, we will still fix it as long as the individual falls in our income guidelines. And repair costs start at $25. So that could be a complete reinstall or an up, upgrade to a Windows 10 operating system, um, virus clean, things like that. Um, if, if hard and things need to be purchased that we don't have in-house, um, a screen is broken or something like that, might be an additional cost for that. But overall, um, the repair cost is typically $5. In 2017, we repaired 2,250 computers total, and that number is also continuing to grow. Part of what we do is offering affordable Internet access. Um, the internet we offer is available anywhere Sprint has 4G LTE service. Um, a recipient purchases a device from us for $8. It's a portable hotspot about the size of a deck of cards. Um, and it's, since it's portable, um, it's got a battery like a cell phone, so people, um, individuals can charge it like they would, bring it around with them. Um, and it's also a pay-as-you-go uh, plan. So it's a, a paid plan if they purchase a year of service. $120, which comes out $10 per month of limited high-speed free internet service, so it doesn't get kicked after they've used it a certain amount per month, which is a huge deal for a lot of our families. In 17, we've had 8,600 new subscribers, um, and in total, since we transitioned to Sprint in January of 2016, signed up 25,333 subscribers, um, and that's just homes. So a lot more people than that are getting access to the Internet. The average family size of a, an in, a home that works with us is 3.3 people. Um, so it's definitely a, a large number of people who are now able to gain access because of our partnerships with Mobile Beacon and Mobile Citizen nonprofits um, that partner with to gain access to that Sprint network. To kind of highlight uh, what it is to be eligible for our program, a recipient. Um, we do, do work with um, individuals as well as 501c3 nonprofit organizations are eligible for our services. Um, but as an individual, to be eligible um, to receive either computers or internet, um, an individual would be 200% or below of the federal poverty level or on some form of government assistance or a documented disability lives in an area with limited access to technology. Um, we try and make it as easy of a process um, to sign up for our services as possible. So we just ask that someone brings a photo ID and proof of eligibility. Um, so that can be something as simple as a, a letter from the school saying their children receive free or reduced lunch, um, a, a medical assistance card that's dated, something like that, um, and an optional cash donation. Uh, like I said, we try and make it as easy as possible for people to sign up for our services. Um, and so I want to get a an in, quick in and out process for them so that when they come, they are able to get a computer and internet that day if they choose. And by the time they walk out the door, the internet's active, the computer's ready to use. And there's uh, some some other ways of how you can work with us. And one of those ways is to become a partner through our Bridging the Gap program. Uh, and this program is a, a, a free platform that we've created in partnership with Google Beacon. It allows access to our online sales page, um, organizations to put their logo on that sales page and create a unique URL. And so I have a 1C3 nonprofit organizations, school and other government entities such as um, housing associations, um, workforce centers, et cetera, to help distribute our services. Um, it's a great way for individuals to sign up for our program without having to come into one of our offices or those who might struggle um, having, accessing our site without assistance. Um, it's a free um, 
a program for anyone who wants to sign up. We've created a, the flyers that you can hand out so there's no administrative burden. Um, and it also allows you to measure the impact you're having in the community. Anyone who signs up for our services through our um, form is tracked. We are able to provide you with a yearly um, uh, breakdown of, of how many people have signed up for internet service or received a computer. We are um, keeping an active internet service, uh, demographics of those who've signed up, and, and a lot of organizations who've already signed up for this program um, find those very helpful when they're kind of find out what, figuring out ways to broaden the reach of their digital inclusion efforts. Um, that, those sort of numbers to point to when, when grants and things like that is really helpful to show the impact you're already having within this um, dual in inclusion effort. Another way to become a partner is through doing a distribution event. Um, I've talked on this a little bit when I talked about our mobile distribution events. Uh, one day of events where we give out 50 to 300 computers and internet devices. Um, to pre-chosen people, partner with schools, workforce centers, or other nonprofit organizations to find these recipients. Um, and all the ways that these are funded are through um, foundations, local businesses, and government entities. Um, the Blandon Foundation is one organization that funds a lot of these distribution events throughout rural Minnesota, as well as the Otto Bremer Foundation as we've kind of reached out further. Uh, so we're always looking for ways that we can do um, this sort of work and help your communities. Uh, a more recent way that um, we've did um, advertising ways to partner with us is through a hotspot checkout lending program. Um, we've done this with both libraries and schools and are always willing to work with you. Um, even at one of these programs that might first come to mind of, of lending things um, and, and see if we can make it work for you. The bigger uh, libraries we've worked with um, is the Dare Public Library System, uh, as well as a uh, recent um, pile ran with Oklahoma State University, which I'll touch on shortly. Um, we also have a few rural um, libraries in the state of Minnesota that are using this program as well. Works is uh, organizations will purchase spot from us in bulk, um, as well as service time, and create a checkout program. Um, uh, loan period we've seen is two weeks, but as an organization, you can make that decision of how long you want to lend it out. Um, through the uh, the Gap Portal program that I touched on earlier, um, you're able to manage the devices. So if you check it out to a family and it's after the two weeks and they haven't brought it back, you can, through the click of a button, make sure that service is blocked so they can no longer use the Internet. And once the hotspot's returned, through the button, um, the service is unblocked again um, to allow you to check it out to the next family. Um, and along with this, we're able to provide um, data of the, the how much data is. We're able to provide information about how much internet data is used um, monthly. So to touch a little bit more on the partnership that we have with Oklahoma State University, um, it's a pilot project and they came to us and, and we're so grateful that they did and it's kind of fun um, to see the impact we're having across the U.S. Um, but to touch on their uh, program a bit, um, it started in May and June of 2017 with rural libraries in Oklahoma, each library getting four hotspots each, and they chose um, for the hotspots to have a one-week checkout period. Um, the participating libraries were Wilhite Memorial, Gregorio Elgin Community Library, Seminole Public Library, and then they had one week checkout. Um, so the program in June, uh, each library has had a, a waiting list continuously for the hotspots to uh, show that it's um, getting of usage. I brought back the hotspots. Um, they were required to um, complete a survey um, to kind of more information about what they're using the hotspots for, how they thought the program helped them, and just provide more information about the, the demographics of those that were checking the hotspots out. So um, the surveys that Oklahoma State University and the libraries got back, they were able to find out some, some really helpful information to hide the impact of the program. Uh, those 
um, patrons who check out the hotspot were under the um, were under the twenty five thousand per year um, salary mark, and a third of those who checked out the service um, report their, um, internet skills had improved or period that they um, had checked out that hotspot. Um, so this is definitely a program that. that um, I've gotten this feedback uh, with the libraries that participated, participated in Oklahoma, as well as those um, that we've heard report back from the Denver Public Library System. And it's definitely a program that we are um, to help grow in these communities, as well as any other interested communities. Uh, and I've included here my contact information, links to our social media and website. Um, definitely write this down if you have any questions after this or um, see how we can partner together. Please don't hesitate um, to reach out to me. But I think now um, I will take any questions. Much, Madeline. Um, you have a couple options for asking questions, and we certainly hope you do. You can either enter them in the chat or either to Jennifer Nelson, otherwise known as Emily, or everyone if if you feel comfortable, just speak up on the phone. That would be great, too. Any cap? Well, that was a quick question. Um, just to tell show it's okay. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, since the game list for hotspot, if um, those are able to transition into things with you to have long hotspots for people or are libraries looking at solutions so that once people have the demand, they've had it for a week or they've checked it out a couple times, that um, they can get permanently in their house or is there an interest in that? I think um, I definitely think there have been people who've shown an interest in purchasing those. Purchasing those. I think this has been the case um, that we can point to in the Denver Public Library system, and that I think mainly is because they've just been doing it longer. We started that program um, in early to mid 2016, um, and I and again the the Oklahoma one was to start out just a pilot program. Um, so they've only been doing it about, about uh, six months. Um, and so since then, um, I think they have looked into um, low funding. And I, of course, don't want to speak for Oklahoma State University and their other libraries, um, but have gotten, it seems, from what's reported, and, and I've talked to them briefly. Um, and I know Denver Public Libraries definitely has increased the amount of hotspots that they've purchased so to help cut down that wait time. But also, yes, definitely we, we try and make our um, program information available. Um, I know there's flyers up in Denver um, about our services so that people do um, kind of once they've tested the waters and, and seen the importance um, that having access to internet can have in their homes are apt to to purchase from their other um, organizations. I know um, there are other programs that provide affordable access to in certain forms. Great. Right. Any questions? Again, you can in, um, ask in chat or just speak up. We we'll to answer your questions. Uh, another question: uh, What sort of the but sort of the ideal organization, what sort of characteristics of um, it were good for a partner to have working with you? I think um, a couple things. Um, organizations um, that partner Bridging the Gap program um, that have signed up the most people so far are programs that seems that already have digital inclusion efforts going on, as well as just those programs who are working with um, I intel base that fall within our income guidelines. Because unfortunately, um, we are, are held, held to those, so if it's any homes that are above that um, income guidelines, we can't assist in any way. Um, so, of course, we're happy to work with, with any organization and, and try our best to make it um, 
um, if that makes sense. But only those that already have a digital inclusion effort going on um, have best luck with finding people out. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Question in chat. Can you chat more about the data collection possible by using a bridging the gap partner? So uh, for anyone who comes into our office to sign up for a computer, um, and this holds true with our, our Bridging the Gap sign up as well, just ask a basic questions. Household size, um, home come, race, um, and, and number of children in the home, I believe, are, are the main ones. And that's all collected um, for our organization and also broken down to those with the Bridging the Gap program. We're able to report on those numbers um, yearly. Thanks for the question. And feel free to ask. Oh, someone has a question. Oh, no. Question. What information is collected via the library hotspot lending? Um, I think I'm answering this question correctly. Um, the information that was collected. Um, specifically some of the numbers I talked about, um, such as the one third of people um, reporting back that they um, had in internet um, usage and comfortability with it. Um, that was a, just a, some questionnaire that, that the uh, local Oklahoma libraries had put together and asked people to fill out. Uh, so that's something they did on their own. It's not a requirement that we had at all. Uh, really good job, I think, of um, a, a checkout program as well as um, being able to get some hard access for all of the, the initiatives that they were working on. Um, and also, I did mention that we could report back usage numbers on a monthly basis. And it would just be um, how much, how many gigs of internet service were used um, each month. There's a question. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Okay. Well, thanks again for attending the webinar, and thanks to Madeline for the great information. Um, feel free, I put my email in the chat box towards the can out. Um, and I can send you a recording link. Um, and feel free to contact Melanie. We would like to continue the conversation. Um, I just think wonderful program, and that I'm so happy to see it expanding um, beyond the sort of home territories of Minnesota and Denver. Um, thanks so much. Uh, we have another webinar about digital literacy um, with a colleague from the Minnesota Literacy Council. That is the same time next Tuesday, 11 o'clock Central Time. Um, it's a slightly different webinar link, so I put, try to put the announcements together so you can get both links, or else you can certainly shoot me an email and I'll send the link to you. So thank you much. Thank you for coming and for your good questions, and hopefully see you kind of next week.